Thank you all for being here today. It's great to see, I think, some repeat customers for Band Books Week, so that's exciting. I'm Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the director of the Harvard Law School Library. I want to take a moment to thank the ACLU at HLS, the Harvard Law School Rule of Law Society, the Law and Philosophy Society for co-sponsoring this event. I think I got everybody. Um, if I forgot, you let me know. I also want to thank some staff members, Gail Harris, Lorena Rodriguez, and Jenny Rose Halpern for their help this week. And I'm really deeply grateful to 3L Josh Smith, who couldn't be here today, who reads banned books and is relentless on the topic of free expression, who really was instrumental in bringing all of these events and all of us together. So I really thank him. And to James Frazier, who's a Simmons uh, student who curated a really great exhibit in the library entryway on the banning of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass by the Boston Watch and Ward Society. So if you haven't seen that, go check it out. So Banned Books as, a, as an event started in the 80s. Um, some librarians and other free expression folks um, sort of kicked this off as a way to respond to and bring attention to the 1982 Supreme Court decision of Island Tree Schools District versus Pico, um, which in part ruled that schools couldn't ban books based solely on content. You know, that of course doesn't mean that schools and other institutions haven't continued to ban books or challenge books on other grounds uh, and still ban books and challenge books based on content. Um, book banning, particularly in public schools, continues today. My first experience with book banning was when I was in 10th grade. And we were, I was taking a women's literature class and we were going to, we were distributed Alice Walker's The Color Purple on a Friday and on Monday we were told that we would not be studying that book. I'd already read it, so I got ahead of that. Um, so that was great for me, but not really great for the other people in my class. Censorship has existed as long as humans have been spreading ideas. We can't seem to resist shouting each other down and using power and authority to control and disseminate ideas. Libraries are often at the center of book banning controversies. And our history with access to information isn't exactly pure. Libraries have pulled books from shelves. Librarians have declined to circulate materials or acquire books. We've um, often under pressure from community members, sometimes as sole decisions. So I just want to be clear, like we're not innocent. But we are, I would say, um, people who stand in defense of your right to read. I'm certainly one of the librarians who does stand in defense of your right to, re to read. And I believe librarians are a bulwark to access to information and free expression and have a professional duty to collect and make available books, art, music, news, and other items in the knowledge economy for all users. We create spaces for learners to engage with difficult conversations like the things we've been talking about this week, these challenging ideas. Some people want to ban ideas and some people don't, and that's an interesting conversation. We collect and curate this material not just for you, not for just for our current readers, but for future generations so that we can make sense of the past. This week, we've talked, uh, our talks have shared a common thread. We're exploring the ways in which political will, either from the state or individuals, attempts to prohibit citizens from engaging with this knowledge, this art, these artifacts, from protest of objectionable material or cu on cultural appropriation, to silence dissent against a communist state, or to wipe out the cultural history of an entire people in times of war. We conclude our week with an examination of the role of censorship in the slave state. I'm delighted to introduce our last Banned Books Week talk uh, on American slavery, slavery, American Censorship, delivered by Professor Randall Kennedy. He's the Michael R. Klein Professor of Law here at Harvard. He's a prolific and award-winning writer, a deep thinker, a thoughtful and provocative speaker, and a great debater. Professor Kennedy researches and writes on civil rights and civil liberties, free expression, and on the intersection of racial conflict and legal institutions in American life. And without further ado, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for the gracious introduction and um, even more for hosting this week-long discussion of 
censorship. My remarks are going to be about the attempted suppression of David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of the world. This was an abolitionist tract that was published in 1829. First, a little bit about Walker. Walker was born in Wilmington, North Carolina around 1796. We're not entirely sure when he was born, but it was, people think it was around 1796. Um, his mother was a free black woman. His father was an enslaved black man, and under the laws of slavery, that meant that um, David Walker was free because his mother was free. He traveled around the South a good bit uh, in his childhood and in his, his early years. Um, he comes to Boston no later than 1825 because his name shows up in the, the, the uh, directory of Boston in 1825. He opened up a modest shop where he sold old clothes. He was an active, outspoken, public-spirited member of Boston's black community. He was the principal agent in Boston for the nation's first black-owned newspaper, Freedom's Journal. He was the local agent of another publication, The Rights of All. He was involved in creating one of the first black political organizations in the country, the Massachusetts General Colored Association. His main claim to historical notice, however, was his appeal to the colored citizens of the world. Actually, his, that's, a, a, that's a, an abbreviated, that's an abbreviation of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the title. I'll read you the whole title. Walker's appeal in four articles together with a preamble to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular and very expressly to those of the United States of America. I, I think that the abbreviation is, is helpful. <laughs> this uh, tract, this pamphlet, was mainly a raw howl of protest. Uh, I'll read you the first paragraph. My dearly beloved brethren and fellow citizens, having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States and having in the course of my travels taken the most accurate observations of things as they exist, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of the United States, are the most degraded, wretched, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. Now, the rest of the pamphlet is about this wretchedness, this abjectness, this subjugation. And one of the things that he's very intent upon showing is that this wretchedness is not on account of the inherent characteristics of black people. Now, he has to say this because there were others that were saying just the opposite. One person that he debates throughout the pamphlet is one Thomas Jefferson. So in Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, Jefferson goes on, I mean, he, he, he makes an argument for the uh, proposition that black people are physically, intellectually, uh, and morally uh, inferior uh, uh, to whites. And throughout Walker's appeal, he argues against Jefferson. And you can, you can sort of, and, and not just Jefferson, but Jefferson's probably the, the, the key figure with whom Walker's arguing. 
But he's not, he's not only arguing against Jefferson there. He, here, he, his, his, um, the pamphlet is divided into sort of four articles. Article one, our wretchedness in consequence of slavery. So he says the main reason why, you know, why is it that black people are, for the most part, illiterate? Slavery. Um, and he, he, he talks about the importance of slavery as a, as a formative influence on uh, the great mass of African Americans in the United States. Of course, again, this is uh, 1829, 1830. Um, there's a, a f small free black population, mainly folk in the, in, in the Northeast. There's some free blacks in the, in the South, but the great mass of the black population of this period is enslaved and is in the South. Um, article, article two, our wretchedness in consequence of ignorance. So this was a period in which even among, I mean, in, even in the so-called free states, black people are not allowed to go to schools. And uh, in many of the slaveholding states, it's against the law to teach black people how to read and write. Article three, our wretchedness in consequence of the preachers of the religion of Jesus Christ. So he talks about the way in which organized religion had been used to subjugate black people. And then Article Four: our wretched, wretchedness in consequence of the colonizing plan. In this period, the American Colonization Society wanted to ship black people, at least uh, free black people, to Africa. And one of his arguments was an argument against that proposition. He thought that free black people uh, had a right to remain uh, in, the, in the United <laughs> States. So it's really a howl of protest. And it's a howl of protest in which he, um, he castigates white American hypocrisy. Now Americans, I ask you candidly, was your suffering under Great Britain one hundredth part as cruel and tyrannical as you have rendered ours under, under you? So he's, you know, he's hypocrisy. He talked about being enslaved to Britain. That was nothing compared to what you were doing to us. He urges the enslaved to resist their masters and assures them that God is on their side. The Lord our God will bring destruction upon them, our oppressors, for not infrequently will he cause them to rise up against one another, to be split and divided, and to oppress each other, and sometimes to open hostilities with the sword in hand. Now he's writing this in 1829, of course, three decades later, there will be a civil war. Sometimes he's cajoling in, uh, his, uh, in the appeal. Treat us like men, and we will like you more than we now hate you. But sometimes he's just straight out threatening. Quote, remember, Americans, that we must and shall be free. Will you wait until we shall, under God, obtain our liberty by the crushing arm of power? So the, the, the thing about this is he's... He's um, speaking in a way that is really quite startling to many people. He's speaking in a way that's much more uh, insistent, much more militant than uh, other, other anti-slavery speakers up to that point had, avoid you know, had um, put, put their argument against slavery. What's the response to the publication? Well, it varied, as you can well imagine. Uh, most blacks who were aware of the pamphlet, free blacks, almost all of whom were anti-slavery, many of them honored the pamphlet. Here's a, here's a, this is a description. It's drawn from the Boston, Boston Evening Transcript. 
Boston paper, that reported sarcastically, and this is a newspaper that was very critical of the appeal, but this newspaper, the Boston, Boston Evening Transcript, reported sarcastically that blacks gloried in uh, the appeal, its principles. And then it's, the transcript says, as if it were a star in the east guiding them to freedom and emancipation. So the, 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 the newspaper is laughing at the black people who embrace the appeal. But for us, it, it's, it's, it's a piece of evidence that suggests that you know, black people who were aware of the publication uh, largely uh, you know, embraced it. Though not totally. And some black people this, you know, were very nervous about this. And actually, there were some black people who really didn't like it. Uh, there were some black people, as we will see in just a moment, who actually turned in the appeal to authorities. Um, so even within the black community, there wasn't unanimity of approval, but a lot of black people were very proud of David Walker, very inspired by David Walker, and embraced the appeal. What about whites? Among most whites who encountered the appeal, there was a very different reception. One reviewer raised the, raised the question of whether Walker, a colored man, could have even written such a learned uh, work. I mean, he was quoting you know, Plutarch, and he was obviously very learned in the Bible. Um, and there, so this one reviewer said, you know, no, no colored man could have, could have written a book like this. Um, there were, what about white anti-slavery activists? Very interesting here. Because there were some white anti-slavery activists. And several of them, several of the most accomplished of them, were made very uncomfortable by David Walker's appeal. Benjamin Lundy. Benjamin Lundy was the editor of the Genius of Universal Emancipation. He was a, uh, a leading Quaker anti-slavery uh, activist. He wrote the following. He said, a more bold, daring, inflammatory publication has never issued from the press in any country. Sounds like praise, right? No, it wasn't. Lundy, who was a dedicated pacifist, goes on to comment, the writer indulges himself in the wildest strain of reckless fanaticism. He charges, Lundy charges, the appeal is, quote, a labored attempt to rouse the worst passions of human nature. William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison, one of my favorites among the abolitionists. Absolutely remarkable person. Garrison was... Um, very uncomfortable. He, exp he said this, he, uh, he wasn't as tough on David Walker's appeal as, as Lundy, but he did say that he, he deprecated its spirit and tendency because it was so militant. It was so clearly willing to raise the prospects of a resort to violence in order to effectuate freedom. Now, um, what about more ordinary whites? The, 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 the part of the white population that was you know, actively anti-slavery in 1830 was this very small sliver, very small marginalized sliver. What did most white people who you know, um, say? Well, considerably more critical. Um, the diabolical Boston pamphlet is the way in which it was referred to in various uh, locales. And then, of course, there were the white slaveholders in the South. 
The white slaveholders in the South who were aware of Walker Sandy work loathed it. It angered, insulted, and frightened them. They viewed it as a dangerous source of contamination that unchecked might well infect slaves with a determination to rebel. This incendiary pamphlet, a police official observed, is intended and well calculated to prepare the minds of the slave population for any measure, however desperate, that they may propose for accomplishing their emancipation. After all, this official complained, the appeal sought to inculcate principles wholly at variance with the existing relation between the two colors of our southern population. Pro-slavery southern whites responded accordingly. When white officials in Charleston, South Carolina apprehended a white sailor who had copies of the appeal, he was arrested, fined $1,000, and sentenced to a year of prison at hard labor. When a police official in North Carolina uh, encountered uh, someone who was possessing the pamphlet, a uh, police official uh, immediately wrote to the governor apprising him of the situation, saying, every means which the existing laws of our state place within the reach of the police are promptly are being used to prevent the dissemination of Walker's pamphlet. When officials in Savannah, Georgia came across uh, the um, uh, copies of the appeal that were in the possession of a slave, the governor of the state uh, called a session of the legislature to tell them what had happened. And uh, the legislature passed several laws. One law provided uh, that anyone found guilty of circulating any publication for the purpose of inciting a slave rebellion could be put to death. Uh, another law made it a criminal offense to teach slaves to read or write. Um, the officials in Georgia also took the following step. They put a bounty on Walker's head, promising, offering $10,000 for his capture alive, and $1,000 for anyone who would kill him. Walker did not live for very long after the publication of the appeal. He died in 1830. He was only 34 years old. When he died, there was a, it was widely thought, especially among black people, that he had been killed, that he had been poisoned, or, you know, that, 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 you know remember I said, there, there was a bounty on his head, after all. But his, uh, the, his biographer, his leading biographer, Peter Hanks, and, and others have come to the conclusion now that it's more likely that he died of tuberculosis. What's, what's to be made of this story of uh, uh, David Walker's um, appeal? Two things, I'll make two points. First, the story is not an outlier. There were many episodes of repression in slavery era America, particularly after the emergence of militant abolitionism. And like I say, uh, David Walker's appeal is really quite a landmark because he, his, his pamphlet can be viewed, I think, as uh, a pamphlet that begins the more militant phase of uh, immediate, immediatist abolitionism. Um, you should realize in, you know, in the 1830s, abolitionism was unpopular. Indeed, it was reviled. Uh, everywhere, not just in the South, uh, in the North uh, as, as, as well. Uh, everywhere in the United States, abolitionism was reviled. And the attack on abolitionism and the effort to repress abolitionist thinking, abolitionist uh, writing took place, it, 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 it uh, manifested itself in a, in a lot of different ways. One, mob actions. Mob in 1835 in Charleston, South Carolina, mob 
went into a post office, removed the abolition literature, and just burned it. So we've talked about burning this week. Well, there was burning in uh, antebellum America of abolitionist literature. Um, again, just not, not just simply in the South, though. Uh, in that same year, right here in Boston, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was overcome by a mob. In fact, mob grabbed him and paraded him around downtown Boston with a rope around his neck. Uh, there was the smashing of presses. In Alton, Illinois, um, there was um, uh, Lovejoy, abolitionist editor, three presses grabbed by uh, mobs, Elijah Lovejoy, his presses were grabbed by mobs on three occasions and just destroyed, just, you know, just destroyed them. Fourth time the mob uh, came for his presses, he resisted and uh, was killed. That was 1837. There were all sorts of other, effort, other ways of trying to um, silence uh, abolitionism. In the South, it became very difficult to talk about slavery at all. One Southern newspaper insisted that slavery shall not be open to discussion. The moment someone attempts to lecture us upon the evils and immorality of slavery, in that same moment, his tongue shall be cut out and cast upon the dunghill. And that sentiment took hold throughout the South. And it also took hold, by the way, colleges, universities. There had been a point in the early part of the 19th century at, you know, for instance, the College of William and Mary, People very openly discussed slavery, open discussion. In the South, at an earlier point, there had been debate about slavery. But by 1829, no more. Silence uh, compelled uniformity of belief. There were other ways in which uh, silencing took place. Um, Leaders of uh, uh, well, the post office. I mean, one of the ways in which people communicate is through the post office. But um, there were, you know, slaveholders said, "Gosh, we can't have this abolitionist literature coming to the, you know, our, you know, our Southland." And so they appealed to um, they appealed to uh, officials who ran the uh, United States Postal Service. Amos Kendall, in particular, the Postmaster General under uh, uh, President Andrew uh, Jackson. And um, the response was a very sympathetic response. The response, uh, Amos Kendall told the postmasters, you know, yeah, don't send this stuff out. Andrew Jackson, himself a slave owner, got very interested in this and said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Don't, don't, don't send this stuff. Um, Andrew Jackson said, another way we could handle it is you postmasters keep the material and then see who shows up to claim it. And if they claim it, and if they say that this is theirs and that they've ordered it, fine, take their names down and publish it. That'll be punishment enough. Um, so these are some of the ways, mobbings, killings, ostracism. Those were some of the ways in which there was an effort to silence abolitionism.
I began by saying that rem my remarks were going to be about the attempted suppression of David Walker's appeal. And it was an attempted suppression. I mean, here's the appeal. Well, that's not a little thing. That's a, it's an important thing. It's an important thing for us to, to understand. Um, there was repression. Uh, in some instances, in many, in many instances, it was successful. I just talked about the, you know, the southern United States. I mean, there really was a very successful quarantining of, uh, of the uh, slave states. But it wasn't totally successful. Abolitionists were harassed. Abolitionists were mobbed. Abolitionists were ostracized. But the slave power never was able to do what it really wanted to do. It really wanted to completely silence anti-slavery folk and abolitionists. And they were not able to do that. Um, the, um, there were no laws in the northern states that were passed that would have um, that would have completely censored abolitionist literature. And there was a fight about this. There were Northerners who did want such laws uh, to be uh, passed, because they thought that the discussion about slavery, well, some of them were, you know, didn't see anything wrong with slavery. But then there were others who thought, well, maybe there's something, you know, maybe there's something wrong with slavery, but if we allow debate about slavery, debate will lead to disunion. And there were some who took the position, you know, that would really be horrific. So let's just nip this thing in the bud and let's just not have discussion uh, about it. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, there were some people who wanted to provide for the extradition of abolitionists from the North, you know, let's, you know, extradite them, bring them to the Southland so that they can be tried. That didn't happen. There were efforts. The governor of Alabama called for the extradition of Robert Williams because of his publication, The Emancipator. The governor wrote uh, to, uh, uh, I think it was the governor of, uh, of New York and said, listen, this is a seditious paper. I mean, after all, look, listen to what this paper says. God commands and all nature cries out that man should not be held as property. It's treasonous. That's sedition. That's dangerous talk. Please let us handle this. And, but that, that, that didn't happen. A, su a substantial sector of public opinion in the North refused to engage in thoroughgoing censorship. And this, by the way, included many Northerners who were hostile to abolitionists. They were hostile to abolitionists, but nonetheless rejected the notion of governmental repression of the abolitionists. When the authorities in Georgia got wind that the appeal was circulating in Georgia. They leaned on officials here in Boston. So the mayor of Savannah wrote to Boston Mayor Harrison Gray Otis and said, could you please do something to muzzle this David Walker? Can't you arrest them? And this is what Mayor Otis said in response. Notwithstanding the extremely bad and inflammatory tendency of the appeal, Walker does not seem to have violated any local laws. You may be assured, sir, that a disposition would not be wanting on the part of the city authorities here to avail themselves of any lawful means for preventing this attempt 
to throw firebrands in your country. We regard it with deep disapprobation, disapprobation and abhorrence, but we have no power to control the purpose of the author. A few years later, Governor Edward Everett of Massachusetts was, um, uh, you know, it was lobbied, lobbied to get behind a law to repress, censor abolitionist literature. He believed that such literature was dangerous. But he resisted calls for such laws because, quote, the genius of our institutions and the character of our people are entirely repugnant to laws impairing the liberty of speech and of the press, even for the sake of repressing its abuses. He thought that, he thought that literature like this was an abuse. He didn't like it. But he thought even worse would be empowering the government to uh, repress it. Now, one of the things that the abolitionists did in the aftermath of, of this controversy and of others, one of the really key things that the abolitionists did, and one of the things that they did that affects us today, is that the abolitionists and their, and, and, and their allies move the discussion about literature like this from a consideration that only had to do with the freedom of blacks to a consideration having to do with the freedom of whites. They shifted attention from the way that enslavement fettered blacks to the way that the defense of slavery was coming to fetter whites. So here's a statement made by James G. Burney. James G. Burney was an interesting character. He had been a slaveholder, and he, 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 he turned, and he became an abolitionist situated in Kentucky. And this is what James G. Burney said in 1835. The contest is becoming one not alone of freedom for the black, but of freedom for the white. It has now become absolutely necessary that slavery should cease in order that freedom may be preserved to any portion of our land. The antagonistic principles of liberty and slavery have been roused into action, and one or the other must be victorious. There will be no cessation to the strife until slavery shall be exterminated or liberty destroyed. So one of the things that anti-slavery folk did was to ally the cause of the enslaved to the cause of freedom of expression. And this, over the next couple of decades, had a real effect because the anti-slavery forces in the 1850s, 18, well, in the 1850s, um, affect very much a new party, the Republican Party. And the forces of anti-slavery remember this repression. They remember what had happened to people like David Walker and Garrison and the others. And they start thinking the repression of things like, of, of literature like this, prompted people to think hard about, well, where do we stand with respect to freedom of expression? And why should we support freedom of expression, even expression we don't like? And that thinking over time uh, becomes crystallized, and it starts leaching into various texts. One text that leaches into is the 14th Amendment. Privileges and immunities. They were thinking of this. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States basically extinguishes privileges and immunities, but only temporarily. 
it comes back. It has come back through the First Amendment. I mean, what anti-slavery folk thought in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, what they talked about, what they wrote about, their thinking about this subject, actually becomes taken up by jurists much later. And in fact, some of the very things that judges write about today in defense of freedom of expression can find an echo, can be, you can, you can, you can see their antecedents if one goes back uh, a century. So the tale I've told is a sad tale in many respects. I mean, look, look at what prompted David Walker to write his appeal. He wrote it because of racial slavery, for God's sakes. But the tale is not an entirely forlorn tale, forlorn tale because the appeal survived and it continues to live. And that is so in part, in large part, because of public opinion rallying around the banner of freedom of expression. Public opinion was the saving grace, not the courts. Public opinion in the 1830s actually was way ahead of judicial willingness to protect freedom of an expression. And it seems to me that, that the importance of public opinion should be a key lesson for one thing, it should indicate why events just like this, events like you know, Ban Books Week, is so, so important. Because today as well, public opinion is really going to be uh, the ultimate and the most important bulwark for the values that uh, we cherish more than the courts, public opinion. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, on that last note about public opinion as a bulwark, what if public opinion rallies to against freedom of speech to take down certain books or publications because they're offensive for certain reasons? Yeah, it's a bad situation. Now, you know, one might say, well, that's why we, you know, we need courts because you know, run away public opinion. And there have been instances in which that's been true. Uh, on the other hand, if public opinion really changes, really, be really becomes illiberal, really becomes repressive, uh, the courts are not going to, I mean, you know, who are the courts after all? Uh, the courts ultimately, you know, who, political processes constitute the courts. So, you know, uh, paper parchment. It's nice to have things written down, but without enforcement, without a proper, enlightened interpretation of what's written, just writing on, you know, just writing isn't going to do it. And by the way, I mean, we've seen this uh, in many, there have been many episodes of repression in American life. This was one, but there have been many subsequently. And when public opinion turns repressive, um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's powerful enough, public opinion will have its way, which is why we need to be so attentive to the way in which uh, we think, to the way in which our neighbors think, our colleagues, our friends. It's not enough just to be attentive to the way in which you know, the judges or the legislators think. They're important too. They're important. 
but regular folk are important uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, we regular folk express our opinion, particularly in America, through consumerism. So I'm curious to know um, more about the publication history of, of the appeal. Um, it's printing, it's sales, it's reprinting all the way. Yeah. Through. Okay. Yeah. So when it was, it was there were there are three editions of it, and. Walker was an interesting character. He, um, he, knew, he, 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 he mainly wanted it to be read by his brethren and sistren. He knew that, I mean, this was a period in which, you know, a lot of people didn't read. So he, he wanted it to be, he, he wanted those who could read to read it. But he was also ex very explicit in saying, OK, now, those of you who can read, read it. Those of you who can read, gather with other people and read it to them. So it has a very sermon-like character. And in part because he sort of envisioned this being the predicate for sermons. Um, he took pains to try to get this to the South. So he hired sailors to take his pamphlet and distribute his pamphlet. Um, he told them he had a price for his pamphlet. But then he did something else. It was very interesting. He says, you know, if you, if you can get the price for the pamphlet, get the price for the pamphlet. But if people are too poor, give it to them. I mean, he was, you know, at heart, he was a, he was, he was a propagandist. He wanted to get his, his ideas out. Um, we don't, you know, was it, was it, you know we, we don't know a whole lot, for instance, sales. We, I don't, we don't have sales figures. And you know, was it a big seller? No. Um, but did it get out? Yeah, and we can see the effect it had. In fact, you know, I mentioned a number of ways in which there was repressive legislation. One piece of repressive legislation had to do with this whole issue of sailors. Because when sailors were found to have this material in their possession, and when they were found to be disseminating it, typically what would happen is if, the, if a sailor was caught with you know, the appeal, he, the sailor would be asked, well, you know, what the heck are you doing with this? And the sailor would say, listen, I don't, I don't know. I can't read this thing. I, you know, I, how did I know? Um, Several states pass laws. They were called Negro Seamen's Acts. And in the aftermath of David Walker's appeal, there were some jurisdictions that passed laws saying that if a ship with Negro seamen, it's sort of interesting because I, I, I just said it was, it was a white sailor who was arrested uh, in Georgia, and you know, it was a bunch of white sailors, but there were some black sailors too. Black sailors, when they would go into these jurisdictions, uh, would have to would have to would have to go to jail for the period that a ship was in the harbor. And these were called Negro Seamen's Acts, and um, you know there, there there was litigation and it raised various very interesting sort of constitutional issues. But that was another way in which there was an effort to repress. One other one I mentioned in passing, but I, I think it de deserves underlining. Remember I said that in the aftermath of uh, you know, the finding of David Walker's appeal, there were some jurisdictions, like Georgia, that 
pass laws prohibiting the teaching of, of you know, reading and writing. Compelled illiteracy is a type of repression. I don't think we often think about it that way, but in a way, depriving people of education. We talk about censorship. You know, the deprivation of education is a type of censorship. And it seems to me, actually, it's maybe a type of censorship that maybe we ought to think about more as a, um, a mode of, uh, of cultural repression. Others? Um, if we wanted to know more about William Lloyd Garrison, do you have a suggested biography or history? There is a, there, the, the, I think the last big biography of William Lloyd Garrison was by a man named Henry Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. Um, there are a number, I mean, Garrison has attracted a considerable amount of attention. Um, you can see the smile come to my face. I'm, I really like Garrison. I, I'm just, I, I, I thoroughly admire Garrison. And Garrison has come in as of late. Um, he's been criticized and criticized rather sharply. So for instance, last year there was the big biography by uh, David Blight, the great biography of Frederick Douglass. And um, Garrison and Douglass, Douglass was a protege of Garrison's. And at some point they had a falling out and people are very, some people are rather critical of Garrison. And in certain ways, he, he, he was a, a, a difficult person, let us say. But he was also a great person. I mean, if you think about it, so here's a person who, from 1831, for the next 30 years, largely alone, publishes an abolitionist newspaper Week after week after week after week. Doesn't miss. Threatened. His paper is largely based, largely supported by free black people. Here's his white man, his, you know, his readership, his main support is free, is, is, is free black people. One of the great things about uh, Garrison you know, there are a lot of, when people nowadays think about abolitionists, they often think that abolitionists, they also sort of conflate being an abolitionist with being a, a racially egalitarian. No! I mean, there were abolitionists who were racially egalitarian, but there were also racist uh, abolitionists. Some of the people who were the strongest, most fervent, most vocal abolitionists were abolitionists because they hated black people. And, you know, I mean, if you have slavery, you have black people, right? At least in the United States. Well, I mean, if you really want to get rid of black people, let's get rid of slavery. And then, so there were some, you know, so. Garrison was a thoroughgoing racial egalitarian in which he taught, you know, uh, he, he viewed you know, black people as his brothers and sisters. And he, brave, persistent. Another thing I liked about Garrison was he was completely uninhibited in his willingness to uh, polemicize against slavery. So nowadays, people talk about civility. Garrison was not civil. He really, it seems to me, he, he, he really wasn't. So, if, I mean, when, um, and when Henry Clay was on his deathbed, Garrison writes an open letter to Henry Clay. He writes an open letter. And he says, you know, dear senator, I understand that you're on your deathbed. Soon, you will see what hell is like.
And he, he, he goes on and talks. He says, you know, you've been awful. You've been awful. You've used your power to, you know, help the slave power. And he goes on and he, and he, and he, and he talks about how awful this, you know, there were a lot of people, you know, oh, come on. The man's on his deathbed. You know, give, me, give him a break. Nope. Garrison was like that. He was, I mean, remember, Garrison was also the person who, you know, would take out an American, you know, the United States flag and burn it. Garrison was, you know, Garrison was a secessionist. No union with slaveholders. Um, that's another talk. <laughs> Love Garrison. Henry Mayer. Any last questions? Thank you for the talk. I'm curious about the reception of the appeal in the colleges and seminaries of the time. Was there any discussion of the text, and was it different in character than the general discussion? I don't, you know, I don't know. Sir, it, not in the South. Like I said, by, by, by 1829, the, the quarantine was in, you know, in effect. Uh, in other uh, institutions of higher education or you know, seminary, I, I, I don't know. Before we leave, I, I guess I'd like to say one thing. One of the things that um, has been um, on my mind about issues of um, freedom of expression on campuses and, and elsewhere uh, has involved the race question. The race question, you know, is a vexing question for any aspect of American life, and this one as well. And one of the things that uh, has, has happened over the past years is the, per the perception that there's a, you know, and not, not just the perception, but the reality in some instances that there's a, a, a tension between the struggle for racial justice and a thoroughgoing commitment to uh, freedom of expression. And one of the things that has been on my mind is trying to get out, get the word out that throughout American history, if one just takes a look at American history, it has typically been the case that the champions of racial justice were also the champions of freedom of expression. In this case, too, the aboli abolitionists, abolitionist position was let the slaveholders talk. Let the slaveholders talk. They were never in favor of repressing the slaveholders. Slaveholders were in favor of repressing them, but they were not in favor of repressing the slaveholders. That was in the 19th century. In the 20th century, if one takes a look over and over and over again at advances in civil liberties, over and over and over again, they come from struggles for racial justice. If we're talking about the constitutionalization of libel law, New York Times versus Sullivan, struggles in the Deep South, if one thinks about the protection of mass dissent Edwards versus South Carolina, the protection of dissenters in the Deep South during the 1960s, if one thinks about organizational privacy, NAACP versus Alabama, when the segregationists wanted to strangle the NAACP, over and over and over again with respect to not only freedom of expression, but also freedom from torture, the entire gamut of civil liberties, if you go back Racial justice has been um, the seedbed, and I, I really think that on campuses, that's a, a, a point that needs to be brought out more. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I forgot to thank the American Constitution Society for sponsoring this, so thank you. Um, tomorrow's banned books, so you can all leave. I'm just gonna keep talking. Tomorrow is um, Love Your Library Fest. Come to the library. Check out our new space. Maybe engage with each other on conversations about free expression. Some of the things we've heard this week.
Um, you can always grab a librarian if you want to participate in Band Books Week next week. If you're 2L or 3L, come find me, because we need to have our programming for next week. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you all. See ya.